Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Moore, Marketing Director here at Positive Luxury. Um, although we're almost mid-month, I'd like to start by wishing everyone a Happy New Year and a warm welcome to Positive Luxury's first webinar of 2022. Thank you for taking time out in this busy start of the year to join us today. We've had an amazing uptake for the webinar and it's so great to see so many people with us. If you're new to Positive Luxury, we've been helping organisations uh, and luxury organisations adapt to the new climate economy now for over a decade. Now, ESG Plus Sustainability Assessment is the only one designed specifically for the luxury industry. The resulting Butterfly Mark certification is an independent trust mark awarded to luxury brands, retailers and suppliers that show tangible action to making positive impacts on nature and society. Today's webinar forms part of our knowledge programme and our mission to both shape and accelerate a sustainable future for luxury. It also marks today the launch of our new 2022 predictions report, which we've called This Is Not A Drill. As a sense of urgency in the title suggests, it's published at a pivotal time and perhaps the beginning of the last real chance to make the changes we need to preserve the planet for future generations. And towards that end, the new report looks at what we believe are five vital topics to be explored for 2022 and that set the tone for the year and the rest of the decade. Resiliency and adaptation, transparency, global legislation, consumer generational divides and new business models. I encourage you all to download the report using the link posted in the chat box. It's complimentary and shouldn't take more than a minute or two to download. And before I hand you over to our host, Positive Luxury co-founder and CEO, Diana Verdi Nieto, I'd like to extend a special thank you and warm welcome to the amazing guests joining us today. Um, plus we're incredibly lucky that they've all contributed to the predictions report. So thank you and welcome to Regan Demas, partner at world leading law firm, Baker McKenzie, Nicole Rollet, Principal of award-winning winery, Shem Bleu, and Catherine Templer-Lewis, creative neuroscientist, futurist, and co-founder of Kinder Studios. The discussion will be approximately 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a short Q&A. We have some pre-submitted questions, but you can also submit questions through the Q&A tab. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our host, Diana. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie, for such a fantastic introduction and very warm well welcome to uh, Nicole, uh, Catherine and Regan. I feel like I just won the jackpot because having you all, all of you in the same room at the same time, I feel incredibly lucky to start 2022 in this way. So. 2022, we predict uh, that will be the year in which the leaders of 2030 will be born or will consolidate their prominent position. Let's face it, the last two years have not been easy, but now somehow we can start seeing the light. We can start feeling a little more comfortable. We are all vaccinated or in the process of, and the world feel I wouldn't say normal, but a little bit more normal than what it used to feel before. So um, I'd like to start this conversation um, because you, three of you, have fantastic insights. So let's start with the things that are changing or have changed in 2020 and 2021 with a speed of light for sustainability. And this has been legislation. So Regan, I'd like to kick off with you because uh, you're the master of that. And I have always a, a real kick in learning uh, a lot about what are the big changes. And you are in this fantastic position that you have a global view. So what do you expect for 2022 and beyond, um, you know, from an environmental perspective in terms of uh, legislation changes? Thank you, Diana. It's great to be here with you all. It's the, the, probably the first time I've heard anybody get so excited about legislation changes. So I'm glad to hear hear that uh, for as a lawyer. Look, um, I think that a lot of us watching this space are a little surprised there hasn't been more development. We've been talking about some of the same things for a while here. So let me hit on a couple of these uh, on the environmental front in particular, at least on the U.S. side, the real thing that people have been keeping an eye on is the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which has promised now over a year to use its pretty substantial powers with regards to disclosure of metrics on climate change and even other sustainability and ESG matters, social matters, to require companies to disclose these things in public filings. We still have not seen guidance on that. Uh, the the um, that was expected potentially at the end of 2021, obviously did not come. So obviously now we're expecting it at 2022. 
I don't think that reflects a lack of commitment. We know it's coming and we can read the tea leaves on what's coming based on, for example, the questions that the SEC issued for public comment um, near the end of last year. Uh, and there were a number of comments that were provided, but questions like, you know, what information should be uh, or can be quantified and measured relating to climate risk. So the SEC is trying to work through, frankly, what a lot of companies are trying to work through, which is how do I actually measure these metrics? What and, and you know, how am I supposed to do that? And what am I supposed to report? They're also asking questions like, should there be different climate change standards that are required for reporting depending on the industry or depending on the company or the place of operation? How should um, the disclosure standards be assessed uh, and enforced? So should it be sort of a shame on you if you don't do it? Or should there be, you know, what sort of enforcement mechanism should there be? So these are the types of questions that the SEC has asked, which are the same questions that companies are asking. So we're expecting that, I mean, I would dare say any time now to come out, and that's going to be a real game changer because that's going to flow down, not just from listed companies in the U.S., but to all of their suppliers, and, and that'll be a big change. Another big one in the U.S. is the executive orders by the Biden administration, right? The Biden administration has exercised a number of supply chain focused executive orders, many of which have focused on national security or uh, computer chips, semiconductors as an attempt to sort of uh, pandemic related resiliency of supply chains. But many of these are also focusing on sustainability and ESG type matters. And they're requiring, um, you know, really there's a carrot and a stick approach here when it comes to supply chains to the, the executive orders. The, the carrot approach is trying to encourage companies to do things, whether it's producing onshore or whatever, that uh, or producing more sustainably, which I think will have limited effect. I mean, it's hard to force companies or it's hard to provide carrots um, to make companies do things that don't make financial sense, right? The sticks, I think, are going to be more um, are going to be more uh, effective. Things that actually like requiring um, um, require putting in place actual measures against companies that fail to do certain things as it relates to sustainability and supply chains. So the executive orders, we could do a whole a whole uh, webinar on that. But the final the the final point that I would raise is um, in the EU. The big thing is this legislation that's coming down uh, on due diligence requirements. This will be the first uh, type of legislation on this front. It's going to cover broader than just climate change. It's going to relate to human rights issues. We know it's coming. We don't know exactly what it's going to say. We've had a lot of clients asking us. And the answer is, honestly, we don't yet know. But the directives really are talking about requirements for companies to do due diligence. It'll probably follow a format similar to OECD guidance on due diligence. But this is going to be a game changer because similar legislation is brewing in the U.S., but as usual, the EU is leading the way. So we'll have to see how that how that looks when it comes out. But the combination of all of these factors are really going to require companies to be thinking about this in 2022 and be ahead of the game. Thank you very much, Rick. And, I, and um, I'll invite you all to download the report and to read more uh, because it's a whole section on legislation there. Um, and I'd like to uh, kind of jump from legislation to consumers before going to Nicole. So, Catherine, you are a neuroscientist, you are a futurologist, you are a trend, uh, you predict trends. And um, I had the absolute honor to meet you uh, when you gave your keynote speaker uh, last year. And, um, you know, you're very well uh, reversed or, 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 or um, you know, Kind of with full of content for um, the metaverse and the new world that is is coming up. I mean, very fast towards us. Yeah. And um, I mean, I know that this sounds like science fiction, but the first question I have many questions for you. The first one is: Please explain in plain English <laughs> to the normal person in the street what is the metaverse. Okay. And uh, why is it relevant, uh, especially for luxury brands uh, today? Yeah. I mean, the metaverse, it, it's a word, it's going to be the word of the year. Um, and it's a word that sort of gets people's heckles up instantly because they think it's some Gen Z, you know, futuristic gaming world. That's what you sort of imagine, you know, ready player one. And it's not that at all. And it is something that that is, that is on the rise. We can see that it's not also the same as the new Facebook. You know, Meta was very clever of Zuckerberg to take that word and take it as his own because it's going to be everywhere and we'll always now think of Meta in terms of Zuckerberg's empire. 
The metaverse is basically a persistent digital space. It's like a 3D internet. It exists at the moment in pockets. So the most famous pockets are the gaming worlds where you can put on a VR headset and you can go into them and play games like Fortnite or Roblox where you build things. What started as gaming worlds that you could go in and interact with other players started over the last five years to expand. It became a place that you could just go and hang out. And again, it started with the younger generations. But then people realized you could go into these spaces and hold meetings, train. And then beyond that, you could co-create. So in the metaverse, you can build a digital world around you that people can enter, whether it's VR or through an AR, or even just look at from a sort of behind a screen on, on their laptop. But it's a world where you can create with infinite possibility. And not only that, but for me, the most exciting thing about it is that when I put on a virtual reality headset, which are becoming more and more accessible, and I enter one of these worlds and start to interact with people, you know, I can interact with friends who are 100 miles away. My brain thinks it is real. It is laying down memories. It is having experiences that are as visceral as the experiences in the world. So for a luxury brand, you have this sort of incredible opportunity. You have opportunity to meet the consumer as a person. You know, Balenciaga, have a, they have their first metaverse strategy department. And their first campaign was a character called Doggo that roamed one of the worlds. And then you could see him in, in, in the physical world as well. He bridged the physical and digital divide. You can co-create with people, which gives a huge agency to your consumers. You can also be incredibly exclusive if you want to be. You know, there's huge amounts of sort of brands hiding things in these worlds that you have to go and find. But also, you know, it's a way of actually building a world without product and consumption. You know, one of the key findings of the report was that we need growth without products and consumption. And now there is, there is another sort of, another a uh, whole argument about the, the eco footprint of the metaverse and that is being addressed. So you have to be aware of how to build in the metaverse, but it's an opportunity for brands to interact with a consumer, especially luxury brands in a totally new way. If you think of luxury thing about symbolic value, that's why we're seeing digital bags. For example, the Gucci bag sold for more in the metaverse as an NFT than the real bag. And by that, I mean, when I entered the metaverse, I put on what's called a skin. It's a costume. I can be whoever I want. I can be a unicorn. I can be a man. You know, and those skins, people change those skins daily and they buy them and they're now being designed by fashion designers. Um, and then I can have items called NFTs, whether that's a sword for a battle or a work of art that belongs to me at the moment only in that world. But it goes down on the universal blockchain, uh, which is where the currency comes in. And I am um, down as the owner of that for all of time it is you know these things are never disappearing and what's more we know they're not disappearing because the world's getting bigger and bigger you know roblox and fortnite to the game to have a hundred million people on them per month as opposed to about six million on tiktok and you know and these are co-created worlds as well and the economy of it is booming so decentraland another metaverse another land where you can go and just hang out with people a block of land sold for 2.4 million pounds recently. You know, this is a very real space that is growing around us. It's going to be an extension of the internet, but one where you can just go and hang out with people and have interactions and have experiences. So that's the metaverse <laughs> in a nutshell. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. I just said, yeah. um, I can be tall and I can be a unicorn. So yeah. it wasn't much of a, a good <laughs> That's how I think about the metaverse, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Catherine, my co-founder uh, founded a company called Top Table back in the year 2000. And I remember um, uh, Karen um, talking about the internet and then talking about WAP phones and, you know, kind of uh, dial up internet. And I remember when she started Top Table, um, she was trying to convince uh, restaurants that, you know, the internet was the thing to have and that it's going to catch on, it's going to grow, etc. And it was incredibly challenging at that time. So hopefully um, this will be easier considering the millennials are there. She obviously grew this company and sold it to a company called Open Table. Yeah. So she was a pioneer back, you know, on, on, on all these fields. But I mean, for me, 
when I hear you speak, takes me back to the year 1999 when people were like, yeah. we don't need a website. Why do we want <laughs> one of those? Yeah. Um, so think about what did happen. And this is going to happen on steroids, meaning yeah. faster. So uh, it's going to be the new normal, people. Yeah. Um, and that takes me to, thank you very much, Catherine, by the way. Um, and this takes me to Nicole because, you know, in the, uh, takes me to an, a, a virtual land, to a real land, uh, the land of wine. <laughs> and uh, you have been a, a trailblazer. I mean, you are a woman uh, and you are at the helm of uh, one of the most successful um, up and coming vineyards in France. Uh, a few years ago, you probably think that all of these were all oxymorons. Today is reality. So um, I'd love to hear from you. I mean, tell us about the soil and the ecosystem and what are your challenges? Because running uh, anything that depends exclusively in agriculture today, from fashion, beauty, wine, travel and hospitality, is a challenge. So I'd like to give the floor to you to, to tell us a little bit more about, about this. It was fascinating listening to Catherine. My mind was racing and I was already designing soils for this metaverse <laughs> exactly the way I would want to have them with just the right combination of microorganisms and everything. So um, there's, uh, at the moment, I know we're not talking about virtual wine yet, although I'd be fascinated to know what happens to a product like wine in a metaverse. And that's um, a conversation that I'd love to have uh, in the future with you. But uh, certainly what we're already seeing is um, that you have virtual uh, virtual vineyard experiences that people are, are craving for when they can't travel, et cetera, but they want to immerse themselves in one of the landscapes that we all, uh, or that many of us like to escape to when we don't want to be at our boring cubicle doing whatever. And so along with beaches and mountains, I think vineyards are probably on the, you know, way up there in terms of places that people want to take themselves to when they want to forget um, the worldly problems. And so with that in mind, we are graced with one of the most uh, unique vineyards from a futuristic point of view, because uh, thanks to my husband, who was 25 years ahead of all of us on this stuff, uh, we selected that vineyard because it is in the heart of a UNESCO biosphere. It has 1,400 species just of butterflies in, in the Ventoux uh, biosphere, and it's a very unique environment with the new luxury, which is to have this uh, extraordinary biodiversity that allows you to have living soils. And then if you combine that with all the right practices, uh, you can have a roadmap to making wines that taste great, but are also uh, sustainable, uh, good for the environment, and uh, more mindful of the health and well-being of your consumers. So if you are going to be in a world without growth, with no with growth, but no products um, or consumption. Uh, hopefully, if you are enjoying wine, you're going to be looking for things in the center of that Venn diagram between those uh, those three things, the planet, the consumer's health, and then the taste and the experience of, of something enjoyable. So with that in mind, we started um, really tuning into what was happening in, in agriculture in general, because the wine world, many people in the fine wine world are craving a roadmap uh, for this minefield of uh, the right certifications, right practices, all of that. And, and, and that's led many of us, by the way, to positive luxury, which is so exciting because it has this uh, fantastic ability to um, bring together a lot of criteria into that sweet spot. And that's what, what everybody's looking for, but nobody really knows how to get there. So we wanted to be part of that. And that le led me to see a little bit in agriculture, some of the crucial things, because I think all of us who care about sustainability have come to the conclusion that agriculture, even though it only represents a, um, you know, a, a relatively limited amount of the um, uh, economic uh, production and of the carbon footprint of the planet has a very unique place in that ecosystem. It is the only way to take 
carbon out of the atmosphere and turn that around systemically. So if you stop using your cars tomorrow and we all use donkeys, then we can stop the, the net carbon emissions. But if we reverse agriculture and we go to sustainable uh, and, and organic agriculture, we can actually take down the damage that's already been done up there. And that is a very unique responsibility. Now, why viticulture within that? Well, it's a very small part of, uh, of agriculture. So according to the OECD, agriculture is 17% uh, uh, responsible for the um, carbon emissions, the, the greenhouse emissions. And of that, you know, only 7 to 14%, depending on the country that you're in, of agriculture service is, is dedicated to viticulture. So it's a it's not really going to be a game changer in of itself, but it does two things. First of all, it's a bit of a canary in the gold in the coal mine because winemakers have to be so sensitive to every little nuance of change in the environment that has a multiplier effect on their product in ways that other forms of agriculture don't have, where they have greenhouses or they have uh, much less sensitivity to the famous terroir uh, and how it affects their product. Uh, so we are very attentive to the fragility of the uh, whole uh, climate system. And then the second thing is that we're one of the very, very few forms of agriculture that has the ear of the consumer, that has a B2C presence. Everybody else is selling their stuff to a middleman who has all sorts of economic necessities to try to keep their margins big and their costs low, et cetera, which goes against a lot of the long-term investment and, and research that has to be done. Whereas we have that consumer, at least on the fine wine area, who is able and willing to hear directly from the producer about why this stuff is important. And with the internet and the disintermediation, that becomes easier and easier uh, to do. And there's there's demand there. I think coffee has a little bit of that, probably chocolate, but there are not a hundred products where we can talk directly and educate that consumer and through uh, these new tools of social media, et cetera, have a bit of a megaphone. And it's fascinating to see how many people with desk jobs in big cities uh, want to learn about uh, viticulture as armchair travelers. They don't actually want to get on that tractor, uh, but they certainly want to understand where what they're eating and drinking is coming from and how it's produced. So we Thank have a, a big responsibility in that area. Thank you very much, Nicole. And let's face it, who does not enjoy a glass of wine? Um, and I think we need one after this webinar. Uh, anyhow, um, I'd like to go back to you, Regan, because we talk a lot about environment. But um, in our report, we've seen that 2022 is going to be the year of social. So COP has last year given a great backdrop for businesses to actually interact in the same dinner table that politicians and governments, um, giving a lot of more uh, kind of awareness on the fragility of our world through environmental um, issues. But the, uh, the framework that are in place from social are absolutely exponentially growing and this closure will be mandatory. So, I mean, Regan, I'd like to go to you and uh, perhaps you can share what you are seeing uh, on the social and the governance front of ESG um, currently and for the rest of the year 2022. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> I think that what's happening is you talk about exponential growth. What's happening is the S and the G are really catching up to the E. And uh, even the SEC, I talked about this, the, the SEC has all these questions focused on climate change and what these metrics would look like. And the last question they ask for comment on says, to what extent, by the way, should the social and governance aspects be included in all this? Right. So it, it's sort of the tail the, uh, of the environmental movement as it relates to the disclosure obligations. But the tail is getting bigger and bigger. And I think pretty soon it's going to be part of the animal. Right. I think there's a lot of perception that all of the it's hard to segregate because environmental impacts have um, have social impacts. Right. And we see even um, advocacy groups that are reaching out to companies with concerns about impacts in their supply chains. They cover all of these issues. Right. Um, and, and so they're typically, you know, if there are environmental impacts in supply chains, they lead to social issues in those communities. So it's really hard to see them. Uh, distinctly. And I think that, that that's what we're seeing and how companies and even legislators are starting to look at this more. 
um, even the the EU dil due diligence requirement I told you, that's not focused only on human rights or not focused only on climate. Um, I saw there was a question about the Fashion Act in New York, and maybe I'll address that now because that's a sort of hot, relatively hot off the presses is moving through um, the legislature in, in New York. And this would be sort of a game changer at the state level. We, the, the, the first game changer was the California Transparency Act, right, which is now you know, been around for a decade. Uh, and it was a pure transparent uh, disclosure statute that, that really had no consequences for failure. And that was focused on human rights related issues um, and forced labor in particular, did not really have a, a, a climate component. The Fashion Act, which would apply to apparel or footwear co companies that do $100 million global in business, but do business in New York, so would really capture all of the luxury brands full stop, is, is, is a much bigger beast and much more in line with, and in some ways even bigger than what we've seen in the EU. So it would require not just uh, disclosure about impacts, both on the climate and the social front, but would actually require disclosure of, of uh, require companies to map at least 50 percent of their supply chains. I mean, from like farms to factories to table, which, you know, a lot of companies just can't do right now um, and wouldn't be able to do. So that would require a massive amount of work internally for companies to say, look, I can I actually map my supply chains? And I think a lot of them would uh, authentically say, no, I can't right now. And the other key kicker for that law is it would actually have penalties of up to two percent of. Uh, global revenues, which obviously could be massive for some of these companies um, if they fail to comply. Now, there's some limitations to the law as it's currently written. The penalty is for failure to sort of disclose. There's not necessarily penalties for disclosing things that people don't like, right? So it's just a disclosure requirement and a, a requirement for disclosing how you would plan to address the issues. Uh, but it also would be rife again for lawsuits in the U.S. This is another big area uh, uh, where companies are being sued. Greenwashing is talked about a lot, but there's all sorts of type of washing right now. And you move into the social area where companies are being pressured to say all of these things to, to, to do and say things. And then they get ahead of their skis, which is so easy to do in this area. And these disclosure statutes just make it more and more risky for companies because and the, the, the need to coordinate internally and know what we're saying. So and look, for me, the social aspects have 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 really caught up. I think it's still legislatively, you still got the climate stuff that's a little bit more uh, on the yeah. forefront. But I think you'll see this year sort of the um, uh, th those issues become sort of head to head in terms of how legislation starts to view them. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And I think this is the time in which we can beat legislation and be ahead of legislation. That would be ideal. Um, I'd like to go to you, Catherine, um, and talk about NFTs because, um, you know, some of the valuations on art and NFTs are ridiculous, mm -hmm. so big. And also, you know, the prices of NFTs in uh, Fortnite uh, for, uh, sorry, the price of handbags are incredible. Um, so, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges ahead? Because you can't really talk, you can't really exchange right now your currency in Fortnite with your currency in Roblox. And also you have NFT trading in a different platform. And then, of course, you have the whole world of crypto, which I will spare you for now. <laughs> so um, let's yes. focus on uh, NFT. Like, uh, it's, it's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, so an NFT, a, a non-fungible token, is simply sort of the easiest way to, to imagine it really is, is for people who ever, you know, in their younger games had a Super Nintendo and they, they played a game like Final Fantasy and, you know, they could have a certain weapon that was unique to them and they carried around for the whole game. That's basically an NFT. It is any digital asset. It could be a handbag, you know, digitally rendered. It could be uh, a sculpture. It could be a whole work of art. Uh, and what happens is if you're the first person to buy it, although, yes, of course, and this is the strange thing, anybody can then replicate it. But in the blockchain, which is basically a decentralized ledger where everything, you know, think of it as all that character records of, of the metaverse. Everything is, is completely written down and cannot be changed without anyone, with everyone knowing. So it's the truth. You know, no one can change what's written in that. It says that you are the original owner. And it's the value, that symbolic value which is meaning that these are going for millions. Like you said, the Dionysus bag, Gucci, it, it sold for more than the physical bag itself. And we're seeing this with cars in the metaverse. We're seeing this with sculptures in the metaverse. You know, Christie's itself have started an auction house 
for NFTs within a land, a metaverse land called Decentraland. You know, these very, very real yet digital objects is throwing into disarray everything we know about owning something. You know, and if you think back to that idea of, you know, luxury value being a more symbolic value, then actually it sits quite well within that. You will can be the, the first owner of a work of art. And every object in a way is a work of digital art. But you're right, the problem is right now you cannot transfer these objects from world to world. So there is a risk, you know, and there's been very interesting collaborations sort of arising between luxury brands and different worlds. You see you have Balenciaga is in Fortnite right now. They're taking over areas and building areas. Uh, you have Tom Ford, did a, he did a collaboration with Animal Crossing, a very strange little world where he, he made, they, they made clothes for all, for all the avatars, the people inside it. Um, and so there is this sort of interesting alliance starting to happen. But these things aren't going away. The risk that you buy an NFT and it will disappear is the, the, the digital worlds are completely persistent and they will always persist, which is an amazing opportunity for luxury brand to be a pioneer and make a real dent in culture, to build part of the world. You know, it's different to the internet in that everyone can build a bit of it. You know, it's like we, we brands can build a part of this world which will exist forever. So the question really is, you know, is there going to be a hype around these NFTs? Will they like some artworks sort of go out of value? With, will the bag suddenly lose its value? That we're not sure about, and that we'll have to see, you know, and I think it's about strategy and being clever, but the money is real that's being used. And, you know, and for that reason, the symbolic value is real and it's persistent. And one day these worlds are definitely going to all link up. We don't know what that will look like now, but just like the internet, just like original, you know, phone technology, everybody, you know, if you had the wrong network, you couldn't connect, that will change. And when we do that, it's going to start by a very strange collection of sort of bubbles that connect but it will be, be a sort of persistent world around us. And just a, a warning tale, you can get mugged in <laughs> the metaverse. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, please tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, it's, the, the one thing that's really interesting, of, of course, is that our, you know, in terms of legislation in, in the metaverse, you know, it's a wild west in many, many ways. That's not to say it's an unsafe space, um, and it's not to say that you're going to lose, you know, lose all your money there. It's more unsafe in terms of things like, um, you know, well, cybersecurity is, is a risk no matter whether you're in the physical digital world right now. It's more risk in things like identity theft. There's a risk of just simple things like, you know, if I if I emotionally abuse you in the, in the metaverse, there's no law to say that's not OK. You know, what does bullying look like in, in the metaverse? So it is very interesting. Um, you know, I think any any organization right now is going to have to really heighten their, their sort of cybersecurity and their savviness about how these systems become hackable. Um, so, yeah, but, but right now in terms of governmental laws or legislation around what you can and can't do in the metaverse, it really is like the original Wild West pioneers, you know, looking for gold. It's quite amazing to see how slow the government has been in picking up on, on what's happening in this world. Thank you very, very much, Catherine. And I can't believe that is um, 3.30 already. So I have one last question for you all, um, which is let's look ahead. So what does 2022 brings to your sector? I'd like to start with you, um, Nicole. And what do you expect uh, for, you know, 2022? And please, if you have any questions, please pop them on the Q&A. Um, so over to you, Nicole. Well, in the vineyard, I think there's going to be um, more and more uh, pressure because some appellations are taking the lead. They're not waiting to be invited. Uh, historically, in a very traditional field, you had a certain pecking order and Bordeaux or some of the established regions would lead the charge and then everybody would kind of copy what was being done in the big regions. With the deformalization and decentralization of fine wine, which has followed the deformalization, decentralization of fine dining, where you have top restaurants in the world popping up and countries that have never had a history of those things and all these uh, a very different dynamic and expectation from the, the chefing world. Uh, on the high end of gastronomy, you have a similar situation happening with happening with wine. And one of the things we've seen is a, a certain randomness of which regions have taken a leadership position uh, in 
federating the winemakers from their areas to, to implement very forceful, uh, sustainable measures. And you've seen Sonoma emerge as a hero. You've seen the whole country of New Zealand be very good at branding itself as having very sustainable wines. In France, uh, we're lucky that our region, the Ventoux, is very up and coming from many points of view, new leadership, et cetera, but also uh, you know, putting on the mantle of uh, uh, sustainable hero when it comes to um, being proactive to get everybody on board uh, in that region. So consumers, I think, will are, are shifting to start to understand uh, that uh, di di dynamism, and it's really disrupting the traditional pecking order of things. So that will continue. Now uh, we also have a strange phenomenon happening in restaurants, which is that. Um, many restaurants are going for fully plant-based menus and that's having a disruptive effect for, for for the narrative of winemakers now you may have noticed that vegan as a word is out and plant-based is in and that's because in marketing surveys uh, vegan has come back as being sort of girly ladies who lunch whatever and the men don't buy into that plant-based is what their doctor recommends with the, to the men when they've had a heart problem or this or that. And um, so plant-based is the way to go. And for that, a whole traditional vocabulary about what you're supposed to have, which wine with, and why it's good with the beef versus the chicken, et cetera, et cetera. And all the people in restaurants recommending things based on traditional things. We all have to re-engineer our vocab to match our wines to these new trends that are emerging. You've probably seen Eleven Madison Park, uh, even Alain Ducasse, a lot of the thought leaders in the restaurant world uh, switching over to plant-based. Um, now, some people are taking that very far. Uh, even some of the narrative around biodynamics, which were always considered extremely planet-friendly and very ahead of the game on sustainability, are now saying, wait a minute, We've all been advocating to use uh, horses, uh, you know, go back to the future with, with horses and manure, etc. We only want plant-based manure and plant-based uh, solutions in the vineyard. Is that good or bad? Has it gone too far? I'll leave that for today, but that is one of the one of the new narratives that's been emerging. And uh, and and circling to to Reagan's uh, area, the whole idea that the wine world, the alcohol world in general has gotten away scot-free into the 21st century without having to tell consumers what's in the bottle. Uh, the fact that it's a complete anachronism that you can't go to a corner shop to buy a sandwich without seeing 20 million ingredients and yet, and making your, your choice as a consumer as to whether you care or not what those ingredients are, how is it that you can pick up a bottle of wine and not know whether it has been made a certain way and whether it does contain uh, certain additives or not. So that as a, as a consumer, you're not looking me in the eyes as often as the case saying, oh, I only have vegan this and I care about sustainable this and re recyclable that and regenerative whatever. Meanwhile, I'm telling you this while I'm sipping some famous brand of commercial wine promoted by whatever, some famous person, et cetera, instead of <laughs> knowing that that wine is made with all the wrong things. So I think some of those dichotomies will start uh, coming together this year and, and beyond as, uh, as people become more educated. Thank you very much. Catherine, over to you. Brilliant. I'll keep it brief, really, but I think it's just, you know, know that the metaverse is is here and it's expanding and it's not about gaming. It's more about interaction. And that's where your consumers are. Start exploring now, really. You know, it doesn't have to be full VR. Look at AR ways to, to you know, have digital realities and just use it as a way to connect on a very human first level with consumers, you know, with your clients, um, know that it's a place of co-creation, know that it's a place of sort of pioneering co-creation um, and actually, you know, start to start to go out there. You know, you don't have to have a whole strategy department like Balenciaga, but actually just know where your audience is and what, what they're doing in there and how you can meet them on that journey and bring them back to the physical product in the physical world. Thank you very much. And it's fun. You should try and it's, it. Yeah, um, it's really fun. <laughs> and, and you can definitely be a unicorn if you want yeah. to. Um, Regan, over to you. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, there's just more legislation coming and it keeps coming. I saw um, Lucy asked a question about the Green Claims Code in the UK. Uh, obviously, I'm not a UK lawyer, but I'm familiar with the code. And 
I think what it what it does is it codifies the same sort of things that companies are being held accountable for in the U.S. through the court system. We're far more litigious over here on this side of the pond, uh, and there are state uh, state laws that companies are being sued under for making claims that are that are um, not true or they can't support. There are more laws coming down. There's the Slave Free Business Certification Act. I saw another question, kind of what are the legislation that we should be thinking about other than the things we've talked about? There's U.S. laws that are going to come down in, in Congress. There's very little that's bipartisan. But one of the issues it is, is things like trafficking and forced labor. It's a bipartisan issue. And if Congress could get its act together, they would pass uh, one of these laws that require certification by companies that, that confirm they don't have slavery in their supply chains. And again, the, the good news is, although there's all these different um, angles where, where companies are being required to disclose or confirm they don't have things in supply chains, the solutions are fairly straightforward for all of them, right? Understand what, put it together a claims process within the company so we can understand like, what are we saying and is it actually true? And that requires cross uh, departmental collaboration, et cetera. Understand and map our supply chains. These are not easy, but they're relatively straightforward in terms of resolving all the different potential legislative uh, pitfalls. Mapping our supply chains. And another law that is causing companies to, to trip is uh, the Customs and Border Protection in the U.S., which is, you know, I, I can't tell you how many clients have called me saying we've got shipments stopped at the border because they came from Asia and we're just not sure what Customs says they think they may have been sourced through forced labor. We have no idea. In order to get that shipment released, you know what you have to do? You have to prove a negative. You have to prove it wasn't made with forced labor, which is almost impossible to do unless you actually know where your supply chains go and where the cotton or where their particular product comes from. So I think the, the bad news, or if you're depending on your review, the good or bad news is there's a lot more legislation and requirements coming down. The good news is that it's actually relatively straightforward conceptually for companies to actually get their arms around this, it's just going to require a lot of work and a lot of coordination internally. Thank you very much. And um, we have run out of time for actually the actual Q&As. Please um, download the report. If your questions are not answered in the report, feel free to email us at hello at positiveluxury.com and we will make sure that we direct the questions to each one of our participants. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Jamie and thank you very much, Nicole, um, Catherine and Regan for this incredibly insightful conversation and for kicking 2022 uh, in style. So thank you very much. And over to you, Jamie. Thank you, Diana. And uh, I think I speak for everyone attending today and saying that was a fantastic and thought provoking way to start the year. Thank you, Catherine, Nicole and Regan for giving us your time today and being so generous and engaging with your insights. Um, you'll find more information on our panellists on our LinkedIn account and we'll be publishing a summary of the webinar soon. And again, I encourage you to read more about the themes and issues you've heard today by downloading our accompanying predictions report from positiveluxury.com. While you're there, sign up to our newsletter and keep an eye out for our next webinar in March as well. Uh, so from all of us at Positive Luxury, thank you to everyone for joining us. Goodbye, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you so much.